If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I have a question for you this morning. It's kind of rhetorical. I don't really want the answer. Have you named these people yet? If you've been here for a while, have you named them? I wonder what their names are. I think at the beginning of this series, I'm going to take some guesses here. I think Dane made a joke like, hey, can I get her number? <laughs> but I know her number. It's 555-867-5309. So that makes her name Jenny. <laughs> then he would be Tommy Two-Tone. Ooh, if you know 80s music, you know what I alluded to. But she has a lot of names. She has a lot of different names. If you're a guy here, that's your ex-girlfriend. That's who that is. And if you're a girl, this is the guy you had a crush on, and that's his girlfriend. Wrong? No, that wasn't as funny, was it? <laughs> At home? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, that's what I do. I tell jokes. I came up with that in the car on the way here. I'm excited to be continuing in our Corinthian series. If you're new here, we have fun. We like to have fun. We can have fun with these things. This is where we're looking at the biblical books, not just a crazy picture, of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They're letters, actually, from Paul, the apostle, to the church in Corinth. They're located in the New Testament portion of your Bibles between Romans and Galatians, if you happen to be looking for them. So here in these letters, Paul is answering a bunch of questions. There's another set of correspondence that we don't have going back and forth. He's answering the questions. They have a lot of issues in Corinth, and some would call them crazy. So we're asking the overlying question throughout this whole series, are we any different as people and the church today? I think we've answered that question over and over and over again. It's a rhetorical question. So today, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to have maybe three major takeaways here. We're going to be fleshing out that discipline that we looked at last week. We're going to be talking about the reconciliation process as a part of that discipline. That's very important. You're going to hear that word a lot, and I want you to have that as one of your takeaways this morning. Not just the discipline, but the reconciliation that we want to do. We're going to look at who we should judge and who we shouldn't judge as Christians. But before we begin, I want to talk about Penny Farms again. And we talked about Penny Farms last week. If you're new here, I will fill you in. We prayed for the people going on that mission trip. In my estimation, it's a medium-range mission trip. It's not out of the state or the country, but it's far enough away, five-hour drive to get you out of your comfort zone. So when you hear that come up again next year, you probably want to sign up for that if you've never done missions before. It's a good place to try. And so what they do up there is they build the PETs, the PET, Personal Energy Transportation Vehicles. This allows people who can't afford wheelchairs to get around, especially in third world countries. Uh, people who have lost their legs. So you go up there and they let you try it out uh, so you know what you're building and then they assign you to different stations uh, depending on what you might want to do or be good at. Um, and so you work on these PET vehicles and then eventually you box them up. That's actually a sta uh, station there. I think I worked that station uh, last year boxing them up so I hope it got there okay. And then they send them out to where they are needed. So here at C3, we have kind of a three-tier missional strategy. <clears throat> we have medium range, as you can see, type of missions. We have close range missions. We believe that the church is a mission. We preach the gospel here every Sunday. We record it, and then it gets sent out to way more people than are sitting here today in this auditorium. The gospel is the core of all good missions. We also feed people here at C3. If you are in need of a meal or you just want a meal, we serve meals after service upstairs in the loft every single service. Uh, Alex cooked up a lot of good stuff today. I think it's going to be great. So we encourage you, even if you don't need a meal, fellowship with everybody upstairs. As an extension of that, we box up the extra food. There's always plenty of extra. And we encourage people to take it out and serve as you've been served. So if you know people who also need a meal, take it with you and deliver it to them. We also do breakfast in the park, East Naples Community Park, 9.30 every Saturday. 
There are people who go out there, they serve meals, they give supplies out, they even fix bikes. It's pretty awesome. We're going to be hearing from Janet Custer from Pregnancy Resource Center. I think November 3rd, she's going to come out and speak to us. They're doing awesome things in the area of abortion and women dealing with that. Long-term or long-range missions, I should say, we're going to be hearing from Doug Barclay from Mission India at the top of the year. So these are just some organizations that we believe are doing things biblically, and they're in line with our thinking here at C3 Church. So we're really excited about that. Corinthians. So the first four chapters, I think I expressed to you, we're dealing with mainly the issue of unity. Well, that's what Paul wants. There's a lot of disunity caused in the church by people following after or chasing after, creating factions over human leaders, human wisdom. They're stuck staring at the finger and not what the finger is pointing to. They're taking their eyes off of Jesus. This is the main issue and what Paul is writing to them about. Now we kind of turn the corner in chapter 5, and we're going to talk about a specific person and a specific issue. That'll be the first half of the chapter. The second half is how Paul arrives at that judgment. So these are going to be the two themes this morning. So let's jump right into the text. 1 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 1. It is widely reported that there is sexual immorality among you, the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is living with his father's wife. And you are inflated with pride instead of filled with grief, so that he who has committed this act might be removed from your congregation. For though I am absent in body, but present in spirit, I have already decided about the one who has done this thing, as though I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus, turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord." So here we have a situation that is yucky, not cool. <clears throat> you have a guy sleeping with his stepmother. That's weird. But this is where understanding historical and cultural context is really important. Not that it was normal. Even Paul says so. It's not a good thing. It's really bad. But if you know anything about history, you know that the mortality rate for females, oh, about 2,000 years ago, was much higher than it was today. They didn't have the same kind of medicine. So if you were giving birth to a child, you didn't have a nice, clean hospital to do it in. And so people would die in childbirth. Women would die in childbirth. And men usually married much younger women, not like what we see here in Naples, worse. They could be... <laughs> they could be i got to stop doing things off the cuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you might have someone who's 30 or 40 years old married to a teenage, what we would consider girl today, woman back then. Well, here's a plausible scenario that we might be seeing here in Corinth. A woman dies, and maybe in childbirth. The man takes a new wife, but he's older. The bride might be in her teenage years. Maybe he has a son who's also in his teenage years. So you have now two teenagers living in the same household with raging hormones and some Jerry Springer type stuff happens. So that's probably what we have going on here. Just a good guess. So they kick him out of the church, hand him over to Satan. Why? The hope is that he will hit rock bottom. He will realize in this life what he has done wrong, he will turn from that sin, be reconciled to the church so that he will be saved in the next life. That is Paul's hope. Now, what we need to understand here, a lot of people could run with this chapter and make it all about the judgments and all this other stuff. I'm flipping it the other way. I want to focus on the reconciliation. So what we want to understand is we don't just go kicking people out of the church for any old reason. We're going to look at a reconciliation process that Jesus commands, that he calls for before that happens. So here we're assuming that they went through that process. But before we go there, I've kind of expressed that this kind of discipline is really, really hard to do today. 
not just because it's hard to kick people out of the church for a pastor. That would kind of be easy. <laughs> but it really doesn't work. It's, it's the effect that it has. And so I talked about why. Now, there are pros and cons of having lots of churches. We have a lot of churches in Naples. I was telling people, I think I passed 12 or 13 churches from my house to here. Now, in theory, that's a really good thing, right? Because you assume if they're all preaching the gospel, what's happening? Jesus is being made known in a big, big, big way. It's really cool. In theory, if it was unified, if all the churches were in unity. But today we have like 40,000, I'm not joking, denominations. It's like 40,000 people that had to fracture and break away because they don't agree about the coffee, you know, or something like that, right? <clears throat> so they're not working in unison. And unfortunately, the church has been very Americanized. And what do Americans do to things? We commercialize them. So our members become like customers. And other churches are glad to take each other's customers. And that is in reality what happens if you kick someone out of the church. They just go to the next church down the street. That's it. It doesn't really work. They just continue in what they're doing and forget about it. And they hop to the next church when they get figured out. They hop to the next church when they get figured out. If you've been in church for a while, you've seen this. But not being able... <laughs> To kick people out of the church is not really the problem. The real problem is that people leave before you can address the actual problem by coming up with a fake one. Christians are really, really good at coming up with problems in the church. Everything from the leadership to the landscaping, the music to the mulch. Yes, I've had meetings about the mulch. Not good. The music. Ugh. I don't like the songs. It's too loud. I didn't notice. I was busy worshiping Jesus. Isn't that what we're supposed to do here? But instead, it's everything else. Like, what are you guys going to do? You're going to complain? Imagine that. Jesus comes back. Bang! The loudest thunderbolt you've ever heard in your life. Oh, Jesus, can you keep that down, please? Like, Try that again, but just, you know, bring it down to like a traditional church level. Like, just stop that. It's too modern for me. <laughs> these things are what's called <laughs> blown off steam. I was a worship leader for a long time. <laughs> these are called the presenting problem in counseling. It's not the real problem. If you've done counseling, you know what this is. It's the problem or problems that people come into you with. They're not the real problem. Right, so if you're counseling, what you're trying to do is ask a lot of questions or try to get people to self-realize Peel back those tear-jerking layers of the onion to get to what the real issue is. It's never what they're really complaining about. So it begs the question, if, if we are given this opportunity, someone comes in and wants to work it out, and we get down to the bottom of it after like 50 sessions, <laughs> and we get to the real problem, if they give you that much time, what do we do? What do we do if someone has a real problem, a real issue with someone else? It's real. What does the process look like? Let's ask Jesus. Matthew 5, starting at verse 21. We have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin, judging council. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to hellfire. So, if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer, offer your gift. So what's the prescription? It appears that after many years, some Christians have interpreted this to mean if you have a problem with someone, don't go directly to them. Instead, just tell everybody else about it, gossip, cause a whole lot of trouble, and then leave the church. It sounds funny, but just as the Corinthians did, people today, even those who call themselves mature Christians, prefer to evade the reconciliation. 
come up with a fake problem and leave the church. But only before gossiping about it, making a big mess, then leaving. Because it's important to make a big mess before you leave. It's key. Did you notice Jesus says, go deal with it. Go directly to that person. Did you notice how he flipped it? He made it even worse. If someone has a problem with you, you go to them. If you even know about it, go to them. Deal with it. So how much more if we have a problem with someone else? We know about it. God says that worshiping with hate in our hearts is worthless. Proverbs 15.8, the sacrifice of the wicked is detestable to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Do you notice how he threw that in there? Before you worship, leave your sacrifice at the altar. Reconcile. Then be genuine about that worship. Now, the common rebuttal is, we don't offer sacrifices anymore. I'm a New Testament Christian. Okay, I'll play that game. Let's see what the New Testament says about that. John 9.31, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to them. Still don't believe me. Remember what I said about the New Testament being one-third Old Testament. Look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter loves the Old Testament. Peter. 1 Peter 3.10, for the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And he must turn away from evil and do what is good. He must seek peace and pursue it because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their request. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. The Lord turns his back on those committing evil deeds like slander and gossip. Now, this is old in the new. Peter's quoting Psalm 34, 12 through 16. And just before that, he writes this, 1 Peter 3, 7, Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding of their weaker nature, yet showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life. Why? So that your prayers will not be hindered. As a side note, remember that fatherly example that I talked about last week. Dads, your sons will learn how to treat women from you and your daughters how to be treated. The point here is that God sees through the lip service and into the sincerity of our heart in worship. We can't expect blessings when we are cursing his other children. God desires reconciliation, so you must forgive, or you won't be forgiven. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Jesus, Matthew 6, starting at verse 14. For if you forgive people their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. Okay, begs another question. What does that process look like in church? In church, we have something called the Matthew 18 process. Why? Because... It's in Matthew 18. So let's look at it. Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. Here's the scenario. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and rebuke them in private. Go and talk to them about it one-on-one -on -one without telling everybody about it. If he listens to you, you have won a brother or sister. Ding, ding, ding. That's the goal. But if he won't listen or she won't listen, take one or two more with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact can be established. Bring in a couple leaders in the church. Got this issue, person's not listening. Okay, let's talk it out. If he or she pays no attention to them, tell the church. But if he doesn't pay attention to church, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. When I first started out in ministry, I always try to get to that last step as fast as I possibly could. Just being real. Young, impatient, not enough love in my heart, not enough Jesus. I always tried to get right there. That's it. One, two, three. You're out. Kick them out, please. Pastor, we got to kick them out. It is kind of like a three strikes and you're out type of thing. I get it. But what's important to notice, there's going to be a little theme here. We need to keep reading. 
greeting. And you'll notice that it is followed by two, not one, but two passages on forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21, Peter, inquisitive. <laughs> but Jesus, <laughs> then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven? He's got a number, right? He's like, oh, uh, well, maybe, I could, maybe I could get to seven, Jesus. Jesus says, ah, I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. There you go. Deal with that, Peter. The other story is about forgiveness as well. You have two slaves. Well, I didn't, I didn't touch anything. Give it a sec. Hello? Hello, hello? Hello, hello? I think I broke it. There we go. <laughs> you guys can hear me anyway. The room's not that big. All right. It, that would have been really bad if it would, like happened during the Jesus coming back part or something like that. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Why are we all still here? <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> the slaves. <clears throat> One goes to a king. He owes the king like $6 million, let's say. <clears throat> Can't pay it. The king, he wants to just sell the guy's whole family and settle the debt. Slave begs him. The king forgives the debt. Immediately, that slave goes out, meets another fellow slave who owes him, not the king, a few thousand dollars. The other slave begs, forgive the debt. But the slave who is forgiven doesn't forgive it. He demands it of him, throws him in prison. King finds out about it. He has the forgiven slave tortured. Jesus says, this is what it's going to be like for you. We have to deal with that. So we must always keep in mind that God has forgiven us our sin. So like the slave it is ungrateful not to extend that forgiveness to others. There's no good person, not even one. We are all sinners, and God has forgiven us. C.S. Lewis wrote, To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Me too. All of us. So, reconciliation is the goal. There's no one here, there, or anywhere better than anybody else. We've got to reconcile it. We want to gain a brother or a sister. <clears throat> so when someone cuts out and leaves the church without trying to reconcile, they rob us of that biblically mandated process. They make it impossible to reconcile. That's why it hurts, because we can't reconcile it. It's like something that just doesn't add up. It shouldn't feel right. Because he didn't do what Jesus says. When someone disobeys Jesus and does not go directly to a person, but instead talks to everybody else about it, that's called gossip. It causes hurt, disunity, and division in the church. It is a disease in Christ's body. In the case of the guy in Corinth, we're assuming that they went through that reconciliation process, and here we find ourselves at strike three. So Paul cuts the cancer out. We must note that still, what does he say? The hope is still reconciliation. Reconciliation is always the goal. The hope is that he will become benign. He will change. Paul knows if we've dealt with him now three times here, the Holy Spirit is the only one who can cause that change. So, the next half, then, Paul proceeds to talk about how we should make these judgments about these people. 1 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 9. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer who is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? But God judges outsiders. Put away the evil person from among yourselves. That can get confusing because he just keeps flipping back and forth there. Here's the point. God 
judges the people outside the church. We, leadership, judge the people inside the church. We are to discern, we are to notice what people outside the church are doing, whether it is good or bad, but they have not signed up for this. They might not even know the rules. So God will judge them for that decision. The purpose of those judging those inside the church is to reconcile, is to reconcile, is to reconcile. I cannot say that enough. It's not to cut people down. It's not to kick. The goal is that's the last thing you want to do is kick them out. You want them to be reconciled. You want love. If possible, and if we're not, yes, then we are to eliminate them. They're called wolves. They intend to do us harm. Now, someone might say, but haven't you read Matthew 7, verse 1? Don't judge so that you won't be judged. This is how people read that. <laughs> Matthew 7, that is, the, that is how people read Matthew 7. <laughs> what it actually says, if we're doing what we're supposed to and we keep reading, you're catching that theme this morning, Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. This is Jesus talking. But inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce good fruit. <clears throat> every tree sorry, that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Scary. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. We see here that we are supposed to judge. Prophets, teachers would fall into that category. And yes, the standards are higher for teachers. James 3.1, not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. And also for us as Christians in general, we are to be that example that we talked about last week. Paul confirms it here again in this week's text. Don't you judge those who are inside the church? It's rhetorical. Yes, yes, you do. We've signed up for this. We know the rules. So we are judged by those standards, James 4.17. So it is a sin for the person who knows to do what is good and doesn't do it. We also talked about that greasy grace preaching last week. A lot of false teachings in that category. A very popular one is that we, as Christians, are never going to be judged. You ever hear that? 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the tribunal of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or worthless. A tribunal is a judgment seat. That's what that means. Paul is writing and he says, who? We, me too, must all appear before it. Now, to clarify before you get scared, we who are saved will not experience the wrath of hell, the final judgment. But we will have to appear before Jesus and give an account of what we've done. Good, grounds of righteousness, or worthless, maybe a timeout. So now, here's the problem if you're standing where I'm standing today. This makes people not want to be Christians. They say, well, I don't want to sign up for that then because I don't want to be judged. Got news, you're going to be judged anyway. And if you're not a Christian, it's going to be way worse. We're not going to start reading that this morning. I think I've hammered it down enough. But many don't want to sign up for Christianity. They're short-sighted, right? I just want to keep doing what I'm doing now. I don't want to give that up. But this is flawed thinking, and here is why. We do nothing by our own spiritual power. Nothing. When we truly accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, step one, we receive his spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who causes us to want to change. That's the point. If this is you today, you will want to change if you accept Jesus. Those of us who have accepted Jesus, we know how this feels. We're like, oh, I messed up. I got to fix that. 
That's the Holy Spirit working in you. But I'll say this to you if you have not. You won't be giving up anything worth holding on to. What's going to be hard to give up? How about hangovers? Who says, I love being hungover. I love hangovers. I love ruining half of my day. It's fantastic. <laughs> Toxic relationships? Who says that? I love being abused and manipulated. It's awesome. It feels great. Maybe the guilt and shame from meaningless sex with a whole bunch of people? Who says things like that? Like, I love it. I love being objectified while at the same time being at serious risk of getting an STD. Sounds fantastic. Or adultery, it feels awesome. I love ruining families and lives. Or maybe it would mean that you'd have to give up hate and anger. Perhaps it's not over someone else. Perhaps you hate yourself. That lack of forgiveness is literally killing you, if that's you today. It's killing you. The Holy Spirit will cause you to want a good life. The devil, on the other hand, he just wants you to see the immediate, not the consequence, the immediate. But you don't realize, if you're stuck in these things, that you're being enslaved. You traded a life of freedom for one of slavery. The slave. It's the cycle of doing bad things to help you forget about the guilt and shame caused by doing bad things in the first place. It's insanity, and God is calling you out of it. What you're being asked to give up is garbage anyway. That's the logic of it. All you have to do is accept Jesus, let go of it, receive his spirit. Paul talks about being enslaved to the law, but this verse applies here as well. It applies to all kinds of slavery, especially the slavery of sin. 2 Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom. You are being called into a relationship with God who is greater than anything this world has to offer. All you have to do is let go of the trash you've been carrying around. That's it. That could be hate. That could be lack of forgiveness. That could be sexual sin. Let go of the burden that is dragging you down into a spiral of regret. And move onward and upward to a life of peace, love, and freedom and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You are being called into the ministry of reconciliation, into the love, grace, and mercy extended to you by God, whose Spirit will enable you to extend it to others. Now, if you have been called out of darkness and into the light, if you know Jesus, let's keep pressing forward. Let's keep our eye on the prize. Let's not let any of these things distract us from Jesus, from being the body of Christ and all the missions that I talked about. The devil wants us distracted from that, right? He wants more meetings with problems than he does just us getting out there and being the body of Christ. So stay encouraged, everyone. Keep showing that love to the community around us so that we attract people to this faith. Amen? I love you guys.